Don't worry though, I'm not going to mention that. A lot of speakers use that joke. So I was very excited to learn that DevConnect would be including a complete and full Viper day. Uh, you can't imagine how much FOMO I'm experiencing right now being away, because that's basically like I don't even celebrate my own birthday, uh, but Viper Day I would go ballistic for. Unfortunately, travel plans to Turkey conflicted with uh, plans here in America for Turkey Day. Uh, but I sincerely hope that all of you who are already awake and at this event and engaging in this uh, fantastic opportunity being uh, that all of you really have, because there wasn't a Viper Day when I was growing up. Um, I hope you just take the most, make the most of it. Uh, I hope you all are going to take some time to interact with all of the most forward-thinking developers who are here right now building the future of finance. So make sure that you, after the speech, of course, look to the person to the left, look to the person to the right, and you know, ask them what they're doing here, what they're building. And even though we're not able to join you all in person, we're very thrilled that we've nonetheless been invited to discuss uh, the state of the Viper ecosystem here for DevConnect. So before we get started, uh, before everyone, uh, you're able to see the slides, right? Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay, let me know if you can't see the slides. Uh, we have a slide up here showing what to expect from this talk. So for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna be talking a lot about the community's resilience in the face of adversity, uh, how we've all kind of banded together to overcome some of the tough times that have fell us as a community, uh, some of the technical milestones that we've seen emerging from the Viper ecosystem, and then the future outlook of all the technologies Viper, Titanoboa, and some of the other projects that are being built. So when we set out to talk about the state of the Viper ecosystem, given everything that we've been through over the past year, it was very clear that the entire kind of thrust of the presentation was gonna boil down to one theme, and that's of course resilience. And you know, there's always been the saying that's gone around through the Viper community, snacks together strong. Uh, but it really took on a tremendous import because uh, for so many people, this has been just a very, very tough year. And when I say that, I don't even necessarily mean just Viper as a whole, uh, because we're only as strong as the individuals within this community. And you know, we've seen some just tough injuries uh, befalling many of our community's most beloved members. We know that Web3 alone is already hard enough to stomach well, with all the hacks, uh, you know, all the effects of the bear market, um, but it just really hurts when we see individuals in our community feeling snack bit. And it's not even just injuries, but the kind of emotional burnout that some of us can feel sometimes. Uh, you know, it's been a very tough time. And therefore, it seemed like resilience was a really important theme that was worth stressing when we talk about the state of Viper ecosystem. And therefore, in the spirit of resilience, I think it's important to rip the Band-Aid off and get through the most uncomfortable part early, which is, um, you know, of course, the two-ton serpent in the room. Let's talk about the kind of unfortunate hack that occurred in July so that we can get through that and move on to the more pleasant bits about Viper. Yeah, I think when I was going back to review the idea of where we are in terms of Viper, I feel mostly just very fortunate that we're all still around to have a Viper Day, given that the defining event of the past year was this really unfortunate zero-day exploit, which would see tens of millions of dollars drained out of four curve pools. It's really particularly difficult for me to see uh, that this was kind of the like defining event of the year because there's really so much amazing technical innovation and progress and just great memes, great, uh, great personalities emerging from the Viper community. There's all this fine work and yet this was also the first time that Viper got breakthrough national attention. And it's not for any of these positive developments, but the result of this really freak accident. And 
this freak accident had so many terrible miniature ironies that end up being wrapped up in this event. Uh, so I keep going back to the three organizing principles of Viper. Uh, these are the kind of foundational axioms of Viper that are so fundamental and critical that I would imagine that someone here in this room probably has it tattooed on their bodies. Uh, no need to show it off if it's in an embarrassing place, but that's security, simplicity, and auditability. And this hack was really tough to swallow because these values are more than just lip service. Like, I've really seen that Viper strongly embodies these values. Uh, it's not lip service, it's, um, you know, Viper's team has some of the leading security chats in the space who just put so much effort into ingraining this concept of security, simplicity, and auditability into every level of the compiler. And the real deepest slash of all this might be that uh, everything that happened happened from a reentrancy bug. And reentrancy attacks have always been such a pernicious aspect of smart contract programming, going all the way back to the earliest days of Ethereum. So anyone that was around uh, to see Ethereum's launch is familiar with the, the DAO, which had basically accumulated like almost a third of Ethereum's TVL uh, or Ethereum's value uh, into it in the early days. And of course, there was a reentrancy bug that would end up draining most of that and lead to this incredibly contentious hard fork of Ethereum. So I just bring this up to say that reentrancy has sort of plagued all of the major, major, um, all the major um, like technologies within Ethereum. And I bring this up in particular because before any of this happened with Viper, Viper had recognized the dangers of reentrancy and was working very, very hard to you know, not just use this uh, non-reentrant lock that we see here in the screen here, but actually like was starting this sort of impromptu global dialogue on the actual subject of reentrancy. Uh, I mean, of course, there's the decorator. Uh, which you could use to protect against reentrancy, but the Viper team decided that this in and of itself wasn't safe enough. Uh, so you can see this was a poll that uh, Big Tech Sucks was circulating back in April, asking how people felt about not just um, having this reentrancy decorator, but completely disabling all reentrancy by default. So a global ban on reentrancy, forcing users to explicitly enable reentrancy if for some reason the function needed it. And this is such a beautiful solution that's perfectly in harmony with all of Viper's values, because this is simple, this is secure, this is perfect for auditing. So I looked at this and I was just so proud of the Viper team for actually forcing this conversation about the concept of reentrancy. And it, at the time, it looked to me that this was just another rung in the ladder towards Viper global dominance. And I was excited to see it. So of course, you know, fate being the cruel mistress that she is, it would end up being, of course, a faulty reentrancy lock that would trigger the events of that catastrophic day. The vulnerable code is shown on screen here. Uh, this comes from the Viper postmortem that was written of the actual hack. And as you can see, the uh, flow that was at fault here was introduced in version 2.15 of the Viper compiler. So this was a version that was aiming to enhance the allocation of storage slots, particularly for reentrancy keys. Uh, Viper uses that special non-reentrant decorator to prevent reentrancy attacks. And this decorator should, in theory, allocate a unique storage slot for each reentrancy key being used. Uh, this ensures that the same key, when used across different functions, would share a reentrancy lock. However, in the affected version, the implementation deviated from this intended behavior. Uh, the compiler was allocating a new storage slot for each occurrence of the non-reentrant decorator, disregarding whether the key was already being allocated or not. And as a result, instead of having a shared lock for functions using the same key, 
Each function ended up with its own unique lock. Um, this is an unfortunate and critical oversight that meant that the reentrancy guard could actually be bypassed, leaving contracts vulnerable to the very attack that they were this lock was designed to prevent. So while this was just a very tiny bug, a couple of lines of code, um, in the grand scheme of things, it had tremendous consequences. It not only compromised the security of the contracts that were being compiled with these versions, but it also like, ended up running against uh, everything Viper stands for, security, simplicity, auditability. This is a, like you secure your, all your valuables the trusted lock, the lock doesn't click into place, and everything that you thought was secure ended up being exposed. So beyond this, just everything about the day feels like it was designed to really maximize the pain. Like, in the immediate aftermath of the hack, there had been this uh, uh, war room that got assembled with the biggest brains in the space. And they were all preparing and working to kind of fight things back. And all the best minds in the entire planet, all the biggest security chats, ended up getting front run by a bad guy by just a few blocks, about 30 seconds. Yeah, the team also, of course, in the aftermath of this, needed its full attention on the hack. Um, because of course, like the hack had so many, uh, so many effects that needed to be dealt with. Uh, but instead of being able to deal with the hack directly, the immediate aftermath of the hack, uh, Curve founder Michael Egeroff ended up getting pulled into this crazy whale hunt, uh, which had occurred because this main source of on-chain liquidity for his project's Curve token just disappeared. And instead of being able to focus on the hack, had to kind of raise this impromptu fundraising round to keep his protocol secure. And then even the curve ETH pool itself, being one of the victims of the hack, was itself one of these unfortunate ironies. Because if this bug had been discovered maybe a month later, it would have been moot. Because the pool was due to be phased out anyway because Curve was working on the release of a new TriCrypto NG using kind of the most recent advances in Viper. Uh, but of course, Curve has the concept of keeping it very safe. So it was really dragging it through several audits to make sure that the newest contracts were safe, not realizing that this is just maximizing exposure to the old attack vector. So it was this terrible, terrible week where basically it felt like years were happening. Uh, the good news is that a lot of it is now in the rear view mirror. Of the four pools that were hacked, three of them saw recovery by being able to actually track down the funds or uh, seeing it intercepted. Uh, so a big thanks goes out to the front running white hat hacker coffeebabe.eth who deserves, uh, you know, send, uh, send coffeebabe.eth some money for coffee, because she more than deserves this for just returning the funds that she intercepted while she slept uh, through an MEV bot that was running. Uh, the final pool, of course, that got hacked was the Curve ETH pool. Uh, this was the largest pool, unfortunately. And the good news there is that there is a uh, recovery contract. There's a snapshot. Uh, so users that were LPs in this pool are going to see restitution. Um, also, good news is that this uh, contract that's going to be used to distribute funds is, of course, being written in Viper. So that means that the, uh, there's more Viper code out there for people who hopefully don't have to go through something like this, but the code exists. Um, on the curve side of things, it was certainly a rough period, but thankfully, instead of blaming Viper, which it could have done, uh, Curve continued to stand by Viper. Uh, curve has been one of the longest standing, biggest supporters of Viper. And I think the incident really reinforces Curve's perspective, because Curve's been very alone sometimes in advocating for more compiler security. And unfortunately, this hack proved this point, uh, how critical compiler security really is. But despite like, the calls for funding for more compiler security, it uh, often falls on deaf ears, of course. You know, it has, has seen several supporters, as we'll see. Um, but VCs don't want to fund compilers. VCs would like to fund, for the most part, like random projects that might have a ton, way of making a ton of money. We can see that compilers can secure a ton of money, but they don't always have a route to making a lot of money, so it's not the most straightforward investment. So on the Viper side, not the Curve side, but the Viper side, the mood was possibly more dire uh, because this really hit the Viper community 
right in the heart. And I have to say that in talking with some uh, sub-members of the Viper community in the aftermath, the morale was just devastated, the absolute lowest I've seen. Viper really cares deeply about security, as I mentioned. And here, Viper would end up brutalized by one of the most pernicious and difficult to detect bugs, just lying in wait and kind of ripping through everything. And in the moment, I have to admit that I was actually worried that the pressure would end up, um, it would end up like causing Viper to just like disappear. Like it happens sometimes where open source projects no longer see contributors, they just kind of drift into nothing. Um, what actually I ended up seeing happen was it brought out the absolute best in the Viper community. Uh, so it, we saw an intense outpouring of support. Everybody pitched in to help out. And ultimately, I think that morale in the Viper community ended up rebounding and proved even stronger than I saw beforehand. So we saw a lot of people really step up. Uh, a number of people who were involved in the hack recovery would also publish incredible postmortems on their efforts. So we'll go ahead and close out the conversation on this particular hack, um, but we're going to direct you to some of these postmortems if you're interested in reading more, uh, because there was a lot of really amazing knowledge that got shared, and hopefully uh, people who read through it are going to be able to avoid repeats of any such uh, scenarios. Uh, so right here we see the Llama Risk team. Llama Risk, of course, is the best in the business. If you're not subscribed to them, uh, you have to. Um, within days of the event, they had gone through and generated a complete precision accounting of everything that unfolded, uh, sort of the textbook that I turn to when I look back to see what's going on. Also recommended is, uh, of course, uh, Banteg, who was in the war room. Uh, had <laughs> Basically, no one had really thought of this beforehand, but um, it turns out that one of the things you have to do if you're operating protocols, you need to have a ready list of all the contracts that have been deployed and which compiler was used to, uh, to publish the contract. Because in the moment of the hack, it was necessary to go through and actually look at all the different curve pools and see which ones might be at risk. And Bantech was able to basically come up with a script on the fly to do this. Uh, so he or she wrote up this um, uh, great blog post. Uh, it's very lengthy, very in-depth, but it covers like how you can actually build a pipeline to find potentially vulnerable contact uh, contracts in the wake of a disaster like this. Uh, another member of the war room wrote, uh, this Robert Chen, wrote a masterful timeline, uh, his perspective from inside the war room. Uh, this is just a really fun read because to me it read like a Hollywood movie it was, or like a John Grisham like thriller novel. It was so gripping and so like exciting to watch the play-by-play. -play. And uh, last but not least, and I hope, apologize if I missed anyone's uh, retrospective here, uh, Addison Spiegel, who is now a freshman at MIT. Uh, you can see how he got to be a freshman at MIT uh, because he basically had the experience of watching this all in unfolding on Twitter, now X, um, and he just basically started talking and escalating some of his findings and quickly got pulled right at the center of the action and was able to, uh, able to help secure some of the funds in the Kirby pool. Uh, so just phenomenal work, and like I say, I think it really put to, uh, you know, brought forth the best in the community. And I, sh I should say, there's one more left to point to, which is the Viper postmortem itself, which is just a very good, exhaustively researched postmortem on the incident. Uh, everything about this, uh, everything about this uh, particular postmortem was just in describing in utter detail everything from version 2.15 when hack was introduced to the actual event. And then on top of it, there was a post-mortem in terms of like pragmatic steps that the community can and should take. So these are a bunch of practical steps that we could take to improve the correctness of smart contracts compiled with Viper. This includes uh, improved testing of the compiler, in continuing to improve coverage, comparing compiler output with the language spec, utilizing formal verification tools for compiler bytecode verification, providing developers with tools to make it easier to take a multifaceted approach to testing their code, including source and bytecode level tests, tighter two-way feedback, and then a number of specific action items. 
So these include short-term competitive audit, open-ended bug bounty programs, creating the Viper Security Alliance, a review of prior versions with auditing firms, including, uh, to shout out a few, Chain Security, OtterSec, StateMind, and Sertora, an expansion of the Viper team, which is ongoing. So if you're interested in compiler development, if you have a strong background in Python, definitely reach out to the team. Uh, collaboration with some existing toolkits with for Solidity, because uh, a lot of these toolkits cover Solidity, but not Viper. And then a design language specification to allow for formal verification. And what's amazing about this is this was, again, not just lip service, but the team would go ahead and fulfill on pretty much all of these promises within months. So for example, uh, in September, we saw a Code Hawks audit challenge. What was nice about this was leading protocols all stepped up to donate. We talked about how tough it is to get a uh, compiler to get funded in the past, but in this case, there was a concerted effort to put together a meaningful prize bounty, because one of the issues with, um, with this is if you are capable of identifying an issue, you're not necessarily going to want to, um, like, you know, if you're kind of a gray hat trying to decide if you're gonna go white hat or black hat, there might not be the financial incentive to actually, like, report a bug. You might just hack it yourself and hope that you don't get caught. Uh, but between, uh, I know uh, Curve donated, I know uh, Ape Framework, I know, um, uh, I think Yearn donated to this, and in total is about 150K in prize bounty that got collected for this. So it's a meaningful amount that really made a difference and turned heads. Uh, yeah, we mentioned uh, Sertora earlier. Uh, in the wake of this, uh, Sertora opened up their formal verification prover uh, support for Viper language, and they offered all Viper users uh, access to try out this solver tool through the end of the year, so be sure to check this out. If you're like interested, uh, contact the Sertora team, tell them that you work with Viper, and you have till December 31st to be able to, um, uh, to try out their uh, formal, formal verification prover. In October, we saw that Slither added support for Viper 3.7, and part of this is, uh, came from Viper doing some uh, direct funding to uh, support the expansion of this, so we have to imagine that some of the newer versions of Viper are also in the pipeline for this. Uh, the week after that, Foundry, which is uh, one of the biggest Web3 tools, would add Viper support officially. You know, we also know, like, um, now most of the major tools uh, that are used for blockchain development now more or less have like some acknowledgement or support for Viper. Of course, like Ape Framework that's hosting this fantastic event has always had uh, Viper and Titanoboa plugins. So where I fear that Viper might have just disappeared, instead we saw that Viper actually came through, fulfilled all the action items from this uh, postmortem, and progress in particular is continuing absolutely unabated. So if we look back at the uh, history of Viper in 2023, in terms of the actual like official releases, uh, we got three releases of uh, Viper through the past year. Uh, before the hack, uh, in May, version 3.8 was released. Uh, and this was a toolbox of enhancements and fixes, which was, in my opinion, a true testament to the resilience and adaptability of Viper even before the hack. So 3.8 was sort of like a Swiss Army knife. Uh, there was a bunch of non-breaking changes and improvements. Uh, this included the introduction of the transient storage keyword ordinary <coughs> operators and a raw revert function that was built into the language. So all of these give the devs the control and flexibility that they need. Uh, there was the support for the new push zero opcode, which has been talked about for quite some time. Uh, so this particular uh, release Viper 3.8 uh, gave Viper Nitro Boost. Uh, this also added uh, Python 3.11 support. And uh, in fact, it actually dropped some of the older versions uh, just to allow this to kind of be really focused and a uh, lean, mean machine. And very shortly after 3.8, uh, 3.9 came out. So 3.8 and 3.9 together are referred to as Common Adder. Uh, this one uh, fixed up some loose threads from this predecessor. This is the, uh, some bugs that were identified and patched by the great 350. Um, 
This uh, also included a code size regression and gas performance issue. Then, of course, the Viper exploit hit in August, uh, which, as you can see, was kind of a dead zone, uh, August through September, uh, for kind of all releases. But then, come October, uh, Viper 3.10 was released. Uh, this one was a powerhouse. It was focused on performance. Uh, this included a, a code size optimization mode, which basically meant that uh, when you're compiling the contract, you can choose to optimize for code size or you can optimize for gas. Uh, so these will have different trade-offs depending on what you're looking for. Uh, this included some new Viper-specific Pragma directives. Um, the code size optimization was made in part because it was uh, Viper 3.10 also implemented the 01 selector tables, which was a much more efficient sort mechanism that could be used to optimize you know, for code size or gas. Uh, so these uh, introduced some breaking changes. Uh, this also saw the Viper 3.10 dropped support for some of the older EVM versions, and it would actually tweak the runtime code layout. Uh, so this is just, in my opinion, Viper is you know, constantly at the kind of cutting edge of all the newest like EVM specifications, and already at the front lines of progress and innovation, which is really exciting what we want to see. So. You know, we continue to see Viper evolving, adding security layers, optimizing performance, pushing the boundaries. It was clear that the team isn't just uh, you know, not going to be you know, thrown on its back by the bug, but Viper is like becoming a fortress. Uh, Viper remains stronger, faster, <coughs> more resilient than ever. Uh, on the second line, we also see Titanoboa had uh, three official releases, but if you follow Titanoboa, you know that it doesn't really so much have like releases. Uh, it has basically continuous development that's happening all the time. Uh, so if you're ever checking in the Viper Discord, and you can note that um, you can note that the, the Titanoboa channel, if you have a question about like a feature that's not quite there, and you ask in the channel, odds are good that within maybe a day or two, they're going to point you to the tip of the GitHub repository and say, yeah, just check out this, and this will have the latest thing. And every now and then, they kind of patch together a bunch of stable. Uh, commits as like a sort of quote unquote like official release, um, but Titanoboa, in my opinion, is going to be sort of the killer use case that once some of the UI uh, becomes a little bit easier and there's more like material out there, is what's going to start onboarding people into Viper, uh, just because it's been such a fast and efficient way of developing. Um, like one of the cool things about Titanoboa, in my opinion, is that uh, because of this rapid pace of development, when people have developer issues, like they get solved so quickly that it's actually just becoming an incredibly comfortable place to work in. Uh, just by one, one of my favorite examples from the past year is, you know, Titanoboa being a native Python interpreter means it can just execute directly Python code, uh, which means you can actually like run Titanoboa in a Jupyter notebook and you know, recently, Titanoboa allows for you to actually deploy contracts. Um, and because you can connect now with Frame in, through like your, uh, your browser, this means you can actually just like deploy a contract through Titanoboa through a Jupyter Notebook in Frame, uh, which means that you can write everything, send the notebook to your friend, and then they can uh, deploy it too. So these are the kinds of things that are going to just in my opinion, just like skyrocket the developer experience and make it so user friendly that everyone's going to get on board. And sort of the final piece of the puzzle that uh, Viper had really needed to, in my opinion, like start to be taken seriously. You know, Solidity has like long benefited from like Open Zeppelin, which has all these kind of easy like building blocks available. Uh, so if you want to do an NFT project, just launch that uh, directly through Open Zeppelin's templates. And SnackMet. Stechmate is uh, burst on the scene this year in March, and in my opinion, it kind of allows all these building blocks that people need to become like outstanding smart contract developers. Uh, so, Stechmate includes a range of components like ownership modules that you would see from Open Zeppelin, like ownable access control. Uh, Stechmate includes token standards, you know, the basics: ERC20, 721, 1155. And each contract within Snackmate is very well crafted and shows off the beauty of all of Viper's values. Uh, you know, so they're all simplistic, 
simple, they're all secure, they're all uh, easy for auditors to go through and read through, uh, optimized for gas efficiency. Uh, so just to quickly walk through the SNECmate releases, you know, SNECmate v V1 marked the beginning of the journey, laid the foundation, uh, comprehensive suite of contracts and utilities all rigorously tested and validated. In June, we saw SNECmate V2 continue the trajectory, enhanced contract functionality, included uh, support for like EIP 5267, uh, various token standards. Uh, SNECmate 3 and 4 uh, also released together in tandem. 3 um, uh, aligned with Viper's 3.10 release. And it also optimized some existing contracts uh, towards it. It also introduced the ERC-2981 reference implementation. And uh, the SNECmate v4 was a crucial security patch that eliminated a multi-call value self function. So each of these releases shows that you know, SNECmate, Titanoboa, Viper, they're all evolving very fast and at the forefront of this entire ecosystem. And also shows that the hack did nothing to stop the development pace going on here. So it's not just Viper that saw a lot of uh, big releases. Uh, we also saw that a lot of the big DeFi projects that are building using Viper would keep shipping new code throughout the bear market. So uh, we mentioned Curve a bit before, uh, but Curve had other highlights other than being hacked. Uh, so Curve in May saw the release of Curve USD, uh, which relied on some of the newer versions of Viper to actually like implement some of its more advanced math functions. Uh, Curve also revamped a lot of its older pools under this next generation. Uh, so TriCrypto NG was launched in June, and StableSwap NG was launched in late October. And all of these are kind of fully utilizing like the full like Viper stack. So they're great reads if you're interested in seeing like how this some of the newer generations of Viper could be used. Um, Yearn also had a very, very, very big year. Uh, they had a bunch of launches throughout the year, but I wanted to call out three in particular that happened in the past few months. Um, why ETH, Yearn ETH, is one of the kind of, um, you know, we've seen all the excitement around LSTs and staked Ethereum. Um, so why ETH is a pretty major entry for Yearn into their version of a wrapped Ethereum. Uh, Yearn also redid their entire tokenomics with VE Wi-Fi. Uh, Wi-Fi, I think it's pronounced. Um, and you know, with every generation of uh, VE tokenomics that's been launched since uh, the kind of initial VE tokenomics launched by Curve several years ago, um, all the different protocols that have innovated on this have added their own like flavor and twist to it, and VE Wi-Fi is no exception. And finally, uh, why Prisma was launched, uh, Prisma Wrapper, uh, to position your within the kind of escalating Prisma wars. Um, so your had previously like dipped a little bit into solidity, but is back uh, doing a bunch of Viper, and that's really exciting. And finally, Lido, um, Lido smart contracts are all solidity, unfortunately, but they do use Viper in a lot of support scripts that they launched, and um, Lido in May launched their V2, and I think it's important just to acknowledge uh, just any of these projects that are adding and open sourcing their Viper code uh, means that the, every time DeFi advances, like the code base that Viper has to draw from is also advancing. And as long as all these kind of fundamental projects in DeFi are continuing to launch contracts, uh, we can feel pretty good that there's going to be kind of like Viper playing a major part in DeFi. And then quickly, I wanted to talk a bit about Viper NFTs um, because I gave a talk last year at Argentina kind of lamenting the state of Viper NFTs because you know there wasn't snack made at the time. It wasn't really easy for new people to launch things. Um, but uh, 2023 saw Viper NFTs start to burst onto the scene. Uh, so up until then, the largest NFT had been the NPC NFT, uh, for which I leaned on the team very heavily to use Viper, touting its advantages. Um, and this has kind of allowed for some like basic template contracts to be written, as well as some more innovative modules. Uh, in January, uh, the project released a template for wrapping ERC-721s as ERC-20s which is kind of a useful bear market feature because this NFT price is all plummeted. Um, this meant that it could be wrapped and traded much more efficiently. Uh, but the real excitement for Viper NFTs in 2023 was the launch in May of the Llamas NFT. And this is some of the most fun that I had during the bear market um, was watching the Llama Auction House crank. 
Uh, you can see that the llama auctions occurred over the course of like over a month. Uh, these are happening 24/7. 1,111 llamas got released. Uh, many of them like homages to like major uh, projects within the kind of flywheel ecosystem. And most of these were released as this auction for the highest bidder, 24/7, as I mentioned, one per hour at least. Although in auctions got intense, uh, which most of them did, it would drag on longer. Um, end up with uh, you know all the llama NFTs having a very high floor price. Uh, they accumulated multi-million dollar treasury and also all these contracts again added to the Viper code base because they leaned off the previous uh, NPC NFT, uh, added on this amazing auction contract. So any projects that are now interested in conducting their own au auctions have this amazing template to build off of. Um, what I'm most excited about the llamas for is phase two because they have this multi-million dollar treasury and they're using it to launch some very innovative features that kind of rethink this concept of the NFT is just like a profile pic. Uh, so for example, Llamas is gonna be introducing a full-fledged job market that's built off these NFTs. Uh, in other words, you don't apply for a job with a resume. You send them your Llama. Your Llama has accrued badges by completing work for people within the community. And they're hard at work coding up these custom badges that can get kind of attached to different Llamas. Um, they're also using their treasury to bootstrap projects that benefit the ecosystem. Uh, one that's worth highlighting is JPage, uh, which has recently been renamed as Burrito, uh, which describes itself as, we build crypto apps that print money while you sleep. Um, so this is uh, by the smart contracts leader Redacted. Uh, so unfortunately they're not using Viper, but they're still supportive of Viper. Um, and I just bring this up, project up, up in particular because the Llamas, which is this Viper NFT project, like being, um, you know, uh, being so successful, it's been able to kind of like spur like all this growth and stuff even outside the, um, even outside the Viper ecosystem. So I think it's important, in my opinion, for the culture. Here's a quick look at these llamas. On top of everything else, the llamas are you know just absolutely like gorgeous, gorgeous llamas. So I'm very proud that I own one. Um, but it's an example to me of, um, of you know, Viper culture shining through and kind of touching the broader community and affecting the broader ecosystem. All right, so let's see. Let's talk a bit now about where Viper is going because the community's rallied, as I mentioned, the outlook for Viper is incredible. Um, in the next several like months to years, we're gonna see, um, there's a work in progress version going on with Viper of Viper Venom IR. Uh, this is already generating some amazing preliminary results. So 20 to 30% smaller EVM code and comparable contracts between Solidity and Viper is um, that it's more expensive to execute the Solidity one by 26%. So keep an eye on this. Uh, there's also the long-awaited modules. Um, so one of the issues or complaints that a lot of developers had had was the inability to kind of import code. Every Viper contract had to be written from scratch. And it took a long time for the community to decide how to allow modules in a way that adheres to all these values of implicity and auditability in particular, uh, because it can be very difficult um, for auditors if there's 17 different Solidity files to try and piece through what's going on with everything. Um, as you can see, the uh, code that's being teased here is very elegant. Uh, 40 lines of code that took tens of thousands of lines of refactoring to make it happen. Um, and what's in exciting about this is that it's probably going to come out with the next uh, release of Viper. And it's going to be a meaningful enough release in Viper to merit a big round number. Uh, so it's possible there's like another 3.11 small release or something. But it might also be the next big version of Viper is the big Viper version 4. Uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.0. So a lot of exciting stuff coming forward. And, but to wrap up here, I think I'd just like to bring this back to uh, this uh, community. Because the fact that Viper has been able to assemble such a strong community, strong enough that we were able to host a Viper Day here at DevConnect, um, that's becoming important. You know, there's practical reasons for this. Like now that there's a strong community, we can actually ex exercise our collective power and have a voice on the direction of the Ethereum, Ethereum tech stack. So here we see like uh, being able to have the Viper community rally around specific EIPs in this one case, 5656. 
Uh, it's also because it means that um, we're able to write more and more tools. The more people that are in this community and creating code, uh, the more code that exists, the more that uh, more developers are going to be able to like see examples and get inspired and get involved and get into it. As well as um, as like we continue to write more code, it's going to become this productivity accelerator for each individual in the community because uh, the tool is going to be more powerful, which means that people are going to write more and better code, which has this kind of compounding effect. Um, but you know, most importantly, we mentioned early on uh, the theme of resilience. Uh, because ultimately the community is stronger than the sum of its parts, but what's really touched me throughout the past year is to see just the resilience involved by all members of the community. Because this has been a tough year for a lot of people. Uh, we showed you know, some of the injuries that befell some members of the community at the beginning of the year. Um, but what's been really heartwarming for me to see is that all the people who have gotten involved in Viper have seen their lives improve in some way, shape, or form. And I think that's something that's important for us to celebrate as we're all gathering here uh, in DevConnect. Not just the celebrating the community, but the individuals who make up this community. So as a community, we can like, celebrate that there are people who are able to find purpose in all of our work. You know, all of us are capable of taking pride and success in the accomplishments of our colleagues. Like, uh, you know, I was you know, amazed to see uh, PCA Versaccio, who's going to be speaking later today, when you released Snake Mate, like how excited he was, and uh, I felt like proud of him in, in you know, in by proxy. And you know, finally, like when all of us have advances in our personal lives, like we can also come together and celebrate these. So when amazing things happen in our personal lives, like where do we share these? Because we're all like random and on internet cartoons. Um, you know, we can share this with other members of the Viper community. We know that we're going to have our each other's backs. So, you know, the culture is very strong with Viper, and that's one of the uh, one of the best things about it. Uh, final note to close on is that uh, when we're talking about culture, uh, we can't you know talk about culture unless we're talking about, of course, memes, uh, because memes are culture, and I'm, uh, yeah. Very excited to say that the memes, uh, the snake memes that are being shared within the Viper Discord are still around, and even after all the pain and all the troubles, they're still exquisitely top shelf memes. Uh, so, you know, when I look back at it, I can say I'm so thrilled to say that the state of the Viper ecosystem is very, very strong in, here in November of 2023. Thank you, everybody. We have a yes. bunch of amazing talks coming up. We hope you're able to enjoy Viper Day. Uh, I don't think we are technically set up to handle questions. Maybe we are. Uh, stick around for a second and find out. But thank you all for attending here. such fun I wish I could be there.